twenty eight byte variable, which is going to be uh, some kind of input array. Okay. And then the call goes into this function that calls a scanf on the string that you type in. Okay. So which has a format string next to it. So. So Reed is saying that in in the phase two function we've got a call, and it takes it calls scanf a uh, scanf sorry, and it has a format string which tells it what sort of input to accept. So it's taking six percent these with spaces in between each, and and that would be an integer. So I'm trying to find six digits to give this thing. And then there's some relationship between them or on each one that has to be true for it to not explode. That's right. Okay, so um, what would be a good name for this function then? Read, read or scan or read six integers is what I call it. Okay. Read six. If we click X, we'll see it's called again, so it's useful for us to re remind ourselves what this function is called. So you should be able to now um, look at the, the phase two function and figure out what is actually done with these six hands. Anybody have any questions about x86 syntax? Any instructions that are giving you trouble? Okay. Somebody on this side of the room who can tell me what var four is for? Anybody figure that out? Count. So 
when we multiply that by uh, by four, if we started from bar bar one c, then this would be the first guy that would be would be addressing in that eyeball instruction. But we actually want to multiply by the, the first one. So equation is Uh, ECX is uh, one in the fir uh, our first iteration, and we've got we multiply that by four. And then we add that to our base. So um, so we got. So the min at the minimum, that instruction is going to reference var 1c. And then everything, everything further down the array here. Because as we add, we actually, so this is 0 in our stack, and this is the highest address here. So as we add, we're going to move down the array. But where does var 20 ever get set to something? It's not set to anything. We're not actually, we never, because our, our counter starts at 1, we never have 0 times 4, which would be var 20 plus 0. OK. Var 20 is a pointer, right? What's that? Var 20 is a pointer that's just being, it's, the program's exploding, exploding the way the compiler compiles the, does the variables, so var20 is just some pointer variable. It's being treated like a pointer. Right. Um, so we're only doing offsets from it. We're not actually looking at its value. That's correct. Yeah. Exactly. So, so we're adding, we're adding one to that. Yes. Yeah. But it's never, it's never pointing at so, so we never yeah, do uh, something like no, it's like control. we took the address of it. No, yeah, we never do. Oh, it's stupid mode effect. Mm -hmm. So, R twenty would essentially be R one C minus one. So when you when you do this this subtraction, it actually subtracts four bytes. How many have solved this? Okay, so we're doing a, a loop, right? We're iterating over this this list of integers. So we start out, we start out with the, I'm going to call my counter i over here. I equals one. And we're looping until we get to the counter e equal to six. And we're taking each item in our, our array here. So we take the first one, and one thing you should you should have noticed up above is we compare the first item in the array, so this is a dereference. We're, we're saying, I want the array, and then I want the value at, at the beginning of the array. So give me the first integer, compare it with 1. If it's 1, we'll continue on. If not, if this compare instruction is failed, then we'll, we'll explode. So we know the first integer. We know that's 1. So we've got that. Then after setting I to one, we begin our loop. 
So we say add, add one to EAX, okay? So EAX, I'll just call that A, is two, okay? And then ECX is gets the counter and it gets the first item in the array. So to me, this is I don't like the way this is arranged. You know, at least for for the first time I'm, I'm teaching this to somebody, because really we're saying EVP, the base of the stack, go to the variable R20. Then on, after that, take our counter, multiply it by four, and add that distance to to our, our variable. So we're going in our variable and then moving somewhere in that array. All right. And in this case, so ECX is going to be 1. We're going from above our array, one, one, uh, one integer above our array. So bar 20, because this is bar 1C. So we're starting up here. We're taking. Um, we're taking our counter and then uh, adding adding that times one to our uh, to bar bar twenty. So starting up here, adding the length of one integer. Okay. So this is okay. This is a byte. Uh, sorry, this is four bytes. So, one times four bytes will bring us to this guy here. Okay, so we get one, we multiply it by two, and then we do a comparison with our counter plus. Uh, so our our counter is going to be our offset once again. Um, we're starting from bar one C this time. So we're going to count one space ahead. Okay, this would be counting zero spaces ahead if I didn't. If, if I wanted this one, this is counting one ahead, and that's going to be the result of one times two. So next, we increment our our counter. I equals two, and a equals three. We've got a times next item in our, our array. So it's going to be 3 times 2. 6. Increment the counter. Each of the steps, but let's say you have, you know, you have to calculate hundreds of these. At that point, then you might go to using a script. As long as it's manageable, as long as you have a small number of iterations, you can do it in your head. Then at some point, you might say, well, this is where I can use my Python script and my curl, you know, whatever, whatever is the, the quickest way for you to. Do these calculations. So, I had talked about um, how this thing takes in an input file. Okay. 
So go to your directory where you have bomb.exe. Let's create a new file. If you right click in here, new text file or text document, we'll call it answers.txt. So Correctly, that our first string was public speaking is very easy with a capital P and a period at the end. And we've got our result from <coughs> uh, from this last phase, phase two. 124, 120, 7, 720. Okay. Just a question. Yeah. Uh, is there a way to set up some like, breakpoints to, to see, oh, how many times you've gone through the loop so you can probably get some patterns down? Because it was easier when you actually did the lab to find that. So, so is there a way to set up breakpoints to see how many times you've actually gone through the loop and everything else? Okay. So you'd like to debug this thing? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, um, how about this? All right. So you know what? All right. So he brings up a good point. Um, so at this point, uh, this is somewhere where you could use um, you could use debugging, all right. And one of the catches is that you're going to to have to enter the input as it goes. Um, so if everybody's created their answers.txt, uh, save that file, and in our debugger or in IDA rather. Click on the, the debugger menu. Okay, that's going to bring up a list of options here. We've got process options. So again, this is in the debugger menu. And so we've got application, input file, directory, and parameters. So application is what the debugger is actually going to execute. Um, I don't um, I don't know how exactly it uses input file, but parameters. Um, a directory is going to be the location where uh, you want it to be executing from. So if you were to open up a command prompt, you were to cd to a particular directory, and then you ran bomb.exe. Let's say you ran it from, you were in the C directory, C colon slash, and you typed in the full path to get your bomb.exe. Um, you might want to replicate that behavior, so I might remove all this from the directory. Um, and then it would look when the, the application was looking for files, it would start in the C directory. But I wanted to actually look for the file where the bomb.exe is. That's where I put my answers.txt. So parameters, you can put in answers.txt. Okay. Now. In order to, to actually debug this thing, we can put in a breakpoint. So let's say put in a breakpoint right here. Um, actually, we, we already know. We know the first item has to be one. It's the other ones we're concerned about. So we want to know what is being compared, OK? So at the comparison instruction, click on that line, OK? Um, this is the compare EDP plus EDX times 4 plus local var. Um, once again, this isn't the phase 2. It's the 
fourth block from the bottom. Click on the second to last line. Press F2. That will highlight the instruction in red. And we can execute. So you can either click debugger start process or you can hit F9. And it's going to say this thing might be malicious. Are you sure you want to run it? Well, we've already run it a few times, so why not? Say yes. And this is one of the artifacts of running in, um, since we're running in Windows 7, um, it's actually creating this breakpoint. And uh, so, you know, how about you uh, go sniff out why uh, Windows 7 is doing this to us? All right, so uh, we click OK. Um, it's taking us to somewhere in in some uh, NT DLL. NT DLL is a very common. Um, it's, it's used during the load time. It's available to every application that's run within Windows. Um, so it's it's typically the first thing to be loaded, um, followed by kernel 32.dll. And these things provide the basic functionality that the application needs to talk to the uh, talk to the operating system, and it also uh, that NTDLL helps the application load information into the proper memory addresses. Okay. So F9, like it allowed me to start the debugger, it also will let me continue. Now, in this case, it's saying there is a, a software um, software breakpoint. Uh, that was the error that popped up before. And that's because you can see right here there's an int3 instruction in here. And, and this is actually why we break why we broke here. So um, what we'll do here is this is asking us whether we want Ida to handle the, the exception. Or do we want the application itself to handle the instruction? So if we say yes, the application handles the instruction. It doesn't do anything. It just continues on. Um, this is so. This is how a debugger works. When it hits the int three, it the operating system gets a signal, and and the the debugger supersedes the application, so it takes control. Now, an application is just going to ignore that breakpoint instruction. The debugger says, oh, we want you to halt. Um, now, there are, uh, I've actually seen malware out there um, that, or, or legitimate protection schemes for that matter might do this, is uh, they'll, they'll actually look through the entire memory space where the code's relevant. It will look for uh, CC. Which is which is that byte represents the int three instruction, and it, if it notices that in a location where it it shouldn't be, it will it will not act like it's supposed to. So it won't. It will either not run the application if it's if it's code protection, or if it's uh, malware, it might try to throw you off the trail. It might try to do something uh, benign and and avoid all the all the fun stuff. So. That is why it broke. So what was, the, what was the key you pressed to get it to go past the breakpoint and ask how to handle it? So press F9. Yeah, that runs it, and you get to the breakpoint. Yep. And what do you do at the breakpoint? So after you clicked OK on the dialog box about the software exception, yep. then you're going to press F9 again. It will bring up uh -huh. that 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 uh, dialog box. It okay. asks you who should handle this exception. Okay. okay. Um, once you hit yes, it should stop at your breakpoint, assuming that you put one where I did. Now. What we've got here, I talked to you at the beginning about how Ida has this wonderful graph capability. It displays things to you in organized blocks, separated by jump instructions. So any branches, um, whether they be loops or uh, jump instructions, conditionals. Um, this is the other view. This is the classic view of Ida. And this is what you're going to be dealing with in GDB and Alidebug. 
Um, it's it's compl <laughs> complicated to, to navigate. It's uh, you can see we've got little arrows on the side here uh, that's showing you this instruction flows in this one here. Um, the graph view, if you have it, why not use it? So uh, with with this line selected here, hit the space bar, and it gives us our graph view. Now this isn't always always going to work. You might be dealing in code that isn't organized into a function, so this only works within function functional code. If you have some shell code, some stub of code that's not defined as a function, you actually will not get this view. It will stay in text view. So it puts our, our Ida view right on top of everything. If we move this aside here a little bit, you can see. So right here is our, our live stack. So this is this is our memory. Uh, ESP is pointing here. This is the basis of the function. Um, well, you can see. Uh, we've got this address here. This is the return value in main. Um, all sorts of information. And then we've got our general registers. Okay, And we were interested in comparing our input with what is in EAX. EAX is actually doing, doing the math. So uh, here we can see EAX is 2. So that is the, the answer we should expect. Now, right, now, this is all dependent on your input, right? Because the, the math to calculate EAX is um, uh, based on your input. So you, you would actually have to run the debugger five different times to actually get each of those values, right? Because you would you would go you'd put the the you'd put one because we already knew one was the and first. And you just count how many times it went through. Right, and then you'd run through and you'd say, okay, two is the next one. Then you'd stop the debugger. You'd put two in your input, and then so on and so forth. So, um, in this case, it's actually slower to use the debugger. Although in some cases, when you're doing these iterations, it might actually speed things up for you. But in this case, there was a pattern. So. Right. So you could, if you were a little sharp, you could detect it. Right. But, but that being said, you would have to develop some knowledge about what it's doing. Right. So either you've already figured out the algorithm because you looked at, at the assembly and understood it, or you just did it over and over again until you saw, saw the pattern. Right. Talk to me and I do when you're debugging the edit memory. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, you absolutely can edit memory. Um, that is something I am not going to cover today, but we can talk about it. Um, we'll, we'll talk about it outside. Of course, there was one other breakpoint you had to put the word boom. So now we're we, right. But that was when you had to do the lab. Because right. then it actually would go to the server. Uh -huh. yeah. So uh, I'm going to stop the debugger. Uh, I already did stop the debugger, actually. Um, so to stop the debugger, there's this big stop button. You can hit Control F2 otherwise. Um, and it's going to bring you to somewhere not so pleasant. So uh, just as we did before, we can jump. Um, we'll go back to the main. And if you are in the text view, which you'll see all these numbers on the side here, these are, this is a the address of each instruction. You can see the same one over and over again. That's because all this fluff is just common. And so it doesn't, there's no actual instruction there. When you hit an, uh, an instruction, that's when you'll see the counter increases here. Um, so if you're in that view, hit spacebar, and you'll, you'll get our, our graph. And I think now would be a good time to break for lunch.